Order. I call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Health to order. It is Tuesday, September 8, 2020. My name is Suzanne Lonis Croft. I am the official chair of the committee now. Um, I was vice chair uh, until just recently, and uh, though I chaired every meeting but one of the health committee, I am now officially the chair. <laughs> um, I'm also the member for Lunenburg. Today, we will hear from the Department of Health and Wellness regarding the pandemic response and future preparedness. I ask that you all turn off your phones or put them on vibrate. In case of an emergency, please exit through the back door, walk down the hill to Hollis Street and gather in the courtyard of the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia. We have some new procedures in place to help protect the health of everyone here today. You'll notice you are seated further apart than usual. I am not masked, but will mask if I need to converse with anyone at a, at a close distance. Please keep your mask on during the meeting, unless you are speaking. We have provided bottled water instead of the usual, usual pitchers. If you have a bottle at your desk, please keep the cap on while you're not drinking from it. This is to protect the new microphones. Please try not to leave your seat during the meeting. If you must, you must, of course. I suggest that we all take a break at the uh, one hour mark. Are we in agreement of this? Okay, the one hour mark to allow for this. Perhaps we could agree now to extend the length of the meeting 15 minutes until 3.15. Okay, in order to do that break. Okay. Um, is there anyone in disagreement? Okay. Um, I will ask the committee members to introduce themselves, starting with the Liberal Caucus. Uh, Leo Tobini, uh, member for Kings West. Margaret Miller, MLA for Hans East. I'm MLA Ben Jessen from Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Rafa Di Costanzo, MLA for Clayton Park West. Good afternoon, welcome. My name is Tim Houston, I'm the MLA for Picto East. Hello, I'm Susan LeBlanc, MLA for Dartmouth North. Hello, Kendra Coombs, Cape Breton Centre. Good afternoon, Colton LeBlanc, MLA for Argyle Barrington. We have our clerk with us today, uh, Ms. Judy Kavla, and uh, the assistant clerk, Sherry Mitchell, right? <laughs> and um, our do, uh, Mr. Gordon Hebb, who is our ledge counsel as well. I will now ask the uh, witnesses, starting with Dr. Strang, to introduce themselves. Dr. Robert Strang, Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, Kevin Orrell, Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness. Janine Lagasse, Associate Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you. I will now call on um, Dr. Strang to do his opening remarks. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and uh, MLAs. Um, as I said, I'm Dr. Robert Strang, Nova Scotia's Chief Medical Officer of Health. Uh, with me today are Dr. Kevin Orrell, Deputy Minister of Health, and Janine Lagasse, Associate Deputy Minister of Health and Wellness. We'd like to thank the committee for the invitation to appear, and we look forward to our discussion this afternoon. Just let me take a few minutes to provide some brief opening remarks. As we all know, this new virus, the virus that causes COVID-19, is without precedent, uh, certainly in the last century. We, we've, we've had pandemics before, but never in a modern society with the impacts that we're seeing. Prior to this winter, phrases like coronavirus, physical distancing, and self-isolation were unknown to most Nova Scotians. In short order, however, our day-to-day -day lives changed drastically, and the systems that protect us had to react quickly. Nova Scotia's government, healthcare system, and citizens responded well to rapidly changing and un, uh, a rapidly changing and uncertain situation. Overall, Nova Scotia's response was swift and appropriate. This is clear by our epidemiology. The goal was to flatten the curve, and we achieved that by working together. Although Nova Scotia was the last province to have a confirmed case of COVID-19, we were ready. In the early days, we had two key areas of focus, redeploying public health and health system resources 
to ensure access to testing and rapid follow-up on confirmed cases and their contacts. And in, and in addition, we had widespread communication to Nova Scotians so people understood what we were doing, what they should be doing, and why. 811 staffing and technology was significantly increased to handle a large volume of calls. A network of 26 primary assessment centers was stood up in a short period of time across the province. And testing capacity at the QE2 Health Sciences Center's microbiology lab was increased from less than 200 tests a day to 1,500 a day. Restrictions began before we identified our first case and March and April saw a rapid succession of measures to slow the spread of the virus. Schools and daycares were closed, visits were stopped at long-term care homes and other places with vulnerable populations, and many businesses were temporarily closed. At our peak of new cases, we were testing more people per capita than any other province. Our pandemic response also saw a sustained effort to communicate directly with Nova Scotians. The speed in which new information was becoming available required government to undertake comprehensive communication efforts, including advertising and social media content, and working closely with hundreds of organizations to ensure sector-specific information got to the right people. Our first COVID-19 press conference was held on March 6th, and on March 15th, we began what would become nearly daily press conferences for weeks. On many days, tens of thousands of Nova Scotians tuned in. They wanted, to, they wanted to know what was happening and how they could help. The position we are in today with low to no cases is because the people of this province took the virus that causes COVID-19 seriously and continue to work hard to follow the rules and encourage others to do the same. Behind the scenes was a strong cross-departmental and cross-health system effort to ensure a coordinated and focused response. Examples include a table of partners responsible for purchasing and distributing personal protective equipment, uh, support for our province's most vulnerable through a community services and mi municipal affairs and housing, and support on safe reopening to businesses, not-for-profit agencies and community organizations through the departments of business, labor and advanced education, community cultures and heritage, and health and wellness. I'd also be remiss if I didn't reiterate that the decisions we made have been based on the available evidence and science. In my position, I have to provide advice to decision makers that is based on the information that we have in front of us to protect the health and safety of Nova Scotians. That advice and sometimes the resulting decisions isn't always popular and may not always be easy to implement. However, in this case, I believe our province made the appropriate tough decisions and acted early and quickly to slow the spread of the virus. And the same is true when we began to reopen. It hasn't been easy, but I believe we have achieved the balance between protecting Nova Scotians' health and the province's economic health. And while much has gone well in our response, we must recognize the tremendous difficulties the virus has brought to our province, including social isolation, physical and mental health concerns, and financial hardships for many. Nova Scotians have worried about going to work and being safe as they went about their lives. Families have supported loved ones during recovery. And 65 Nova Scotians lost their lives to this virus, including 53 in the outbreak that occurred at Northwood and Halifax. Every lesson we learned, including the recommendations that will come from the independent review of Northwood and the broad review of infection control in the long-term care sector, will be incorporated into our ongoing work in the advance of a second wave. I want to assure you and Nova Scotians that we are ready. Many of the measures we've announced this summer enhance border measures and check-ins, mandatory masking in most public indoor places, and a robust testing strategy for returning university, university students, along with sector-specific plans to ensure activities are resumed safely, including our back-to-school plan, position Nova Scotia well for what's to come. But aside from the government response, Nova Scotians have acted quickly. They've been kind and supportive to each other and to the work that we've been doing. And most importantly, they've been vigilant about keeping this virus at bay. 
While Premier McNeil and I have often been the public face of, of this event, every Nova Scotian who has played a role in protecting our province deserves our gratitude. Some went to work every day to make sure we could buy food we needed. Others, for others, staying home was the best thing to, to do. It's impossible to summarize the work that has gone into responding to this pandemic. In most cases, it's work that started in January and continues as we speak with you today. But thousands of people ac across our health care system, including the Nova Scotia Health Authority, IWK, all levels of government, uh, and, and, uh, sorry, uh, long-term care homes and home care sectors, EHS and 811, and as I said earlier, all levels of government and across the provincial government, all departments, uh, have all worked harder than ever before to make sure that the supports uh, have been and remain in place to keep us all safe. I do want to recognize my colleagues at the Department of Health and Wellness who have moved mountains to make sure uh, what needed to get done happened. And all, all in all, Nova Scotia has fared well. What got us through the first wave, strong preparation and a commitment to keeping cases low, will get us through the second wave. We'll now be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Strang, for your remarks. We'll start with the PC caucus. Mr. Houston for 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Strang, Deputy, Associate Deputy. Thank you for, uh, for your service to the province over what's been an incredibly uh, tense and stressful time, and I think uh, Nova Scotia has fared well. Um, so thank you for your for your guidance uh, through that process, um, Dr. Strang. Back around um, March 17th, Minister Delory halted all non-emergent health procedures in Nova Scotia. Tests like colorectal screening, uh, that are used to, obviously to detect uh, uh, colon cancer, mammograms, Pap tests, pelvic exams. All same-day admissions and, and elective surgical procedures were all halted uh, back on March 17th. I to, I'm just curious to Dr. Strang, has the, has the minister asked you for permission to resume these tests uh, that are so key to early detection of so many illnesses? <clears throat> Dr. Strang. Uh, thanks for the question. So um, the closure of those non-urgent uh, non uh, health care procedures was not done under my authority under the Health Protection Act. Uh, so I, I, my, my permission is not required for that, but I've certainly been involved in lots of discussions with uh, my colleagues from the Department of Health and Wellness who are here with me today, with the Minister and with the Premier's office, about finding the balance between opening up access to a broad range of health care services, but also making sure we maintain capacity in the health care system uh, to do the necessary testing and, the, and assessment that we're doing, as well as to make sure that we are prepared if there's a surge of COVID again, that we can actually uh, handle that. Mr. Houston. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Strang. So um, permission not required to restart. So presumes that you didn't direct those all non-urgent procedures to be cancelled? Was that something Mr. that... Mr. Houston, um, Dr. Orr would like to also add to that well, question. Uh, well, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask the questions and get the answers, and I'll keep asking questions. I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for Dr. Orr. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Houston. Thank you. Um, so the the closure of all all non-urgent uh, procedures weren't they weren't ceased at your direction. Um, no, they were they were not part of the public health order. They were not uh, that that was there were different policy discussions and conversations, but not directed under the public health order. Okay, so um, so they can be restarted at any given time. Are you surprised they haven't restarted at this stage? My understanding, and I'm going to defer to my, my deputy colleague, who's been more directly involved in those, but there's been lots of uh, movement in opening up uh, up those non-elective, uh, non-urgent procedures. Dr. Oral. <clears throat> so um, I came um, to the job on April the 1st, um, and uh, I came out of the clinical side or the operational side of the healthcare system. The uh, decision was made uh, to restrict uh, all non-urgent and emergency cases uh, can't, before I left my practice to come to Halifax. Uh, the, um, the provision was made for urgent care, emergency care, and for cancer care. Uh, screening and all those other elective investigations were um, put on hold. Um, however, um, the... Um, 
The need for that came as much from the operational side, uh, from NSHA and the IWK, that recognized uh, that they would have to have the capacity that was anticipated uh, for COVID uh, management. And if we at the time looked at the uh, experience and situation around the world, uh, there were many uh, countries, many jurisdictions, many cities in the United States that were simply out of control and had run out of capacity. So this was a way of freeing up capacity. The other issue was that we required staff to be available for COVID management. So some of the people that normally would have been in um, outpatient investigation, diagnostic imaging, um, these people were required for redeployment so that we had capacity in terms of human health resources as well. Uh, having gotten through uh, the first wave and flattened the curve, it became a very significant discussion point that we should initiate um, the, uh, the ability to look after people uh, outside of uh, COVID-related illness. Uh, so again, uh, I think my clinical background played um, to that point that there are a large number of people who do require uh, care uh, outside of infection and pandemic uh, response. Uh, and these people did uh, um, uh, were waitlisted, and uh, the discussion with NSHA and IWK was to um, to get these people uh, that were um, delayed uh, back on the list uh, to have their investigations or their treatments uh, initiated again. So that's we now have a joint committee uh, that uh, basically is uh, reestablishing all of the provision for health care that is normal in, in a normal situation. Thank you. Mr. Houston. Thank you, Deputy. So if, if I understand correctly, there's, there's, as we sit here today, there is a committee that is looking at how the testing can resume. Would that be a fair summary? Well, the testing Dr. is actually Oral. resumed. There is, um, uh, there is uh, um, procedures and investigations and uh, provision of care um, that uh, is normal in, in our normal health care system uh, taking place now. So it's, uh, it's been uh, um, a, a gradual process, but it's, it's ramped up almost to full capacity uh, at this point in time. A hospital admissions, for example, uh, now are in the 90 to 100% uh, uh, range. Uh, in fact, that's probably more than, uh, that than we would like because we still have to maintain capacity for the next wave. So there has to be some adjustment of that. But uh, as soon as possible, the uh, health authorities were advised and they, they went to, um, to full uh, capacity uh, for uh, uh, much of the services that have been delayed during COVID. Mr. Houston. Thank you. Has the minister provided a deadline as to when the minister would like to see the backlog cleared? Dr. Oral. I, I don't have an exact deadline for that. Um, I think that uh, uh, it's a little bit uh, um, difficult to predict uh, based on what may happen during this second wave. Uh, the, as stated, the capacity to look after another wave anticipated in the fall uh, will have significant bearing on, uh, on how we do that. Uh, so um, we're working um, uh, to... Um, during the first wave, uh, we, we basically had, had shut down almost everything. Uh, again, not knowing uh, what was to be anticipated, not having a playbook that would predict this, and looking around the rest of the world and seeing how uh, disadvantaged some jurisdictions were. Uh, so at this point in time, we have to maintain enough capacity to uh, anticipate uh, a resurgence, um, we have to uh, do it in a manner that allows us to uh, uh, free hospital staff and free people from the system if need be, should the uh, resurgence be more than we anticipate based on our first wave experience. Mr. Houston. Thank you. Obviously, there's a lot of Nova Scotians that are waiting for a procedure or a screening or a test. Uh, their stress level is very high. I certainly have a great deal of sympathy for those Nova Scotians. I'm sure, I'm sure your, your team does as well. 
Has the minister asked for um, some quantification from your team as to how big are these backlogs? Mr. Earl, Dr. Earl. Sorry, how big are the backlogs? Yeah. People are waiting for which procedures? Well, we don't have, uh, I don't have absolute numbers other than uh, the, uh, uh, the time frame for which someone would take to be investigated. So for example, um, in my specialty in orthopedics, uh, different uh, um, uh, zones uh, in our province had different wait list time. So uh, when I left uh, Cape Breton, we had a wait time between three to four months. Uh, which was considered uh, to be uh, well within the Canadian standards for uh, wait time for a joint replacement. Uh, with COVID and the shutdown that occurred, um, this has probably expanded now to about a year. So we wouldn't, I, I don't, I'm not aware of absolute numbers that we've been given by NSHA, but I am aware that certain procedures take this amount of time or that amount of time. So it's the time frame that, uh, that would be more um, identified to us. Mr. Houston. Thank you. That's, um, and that's certainly based on your professional knowledge and, and experience, um, which the minister wouldn't have. That's why I'm curious as to, has the minister asked um, how long to, until we can clear the backlog for mammograms? How long until we can clear the backlog for uh, pap tests? How long until we can clear the backlog for colorectal uh, cancer testing, how long can we can clear the backlog for blood tests? These are types of the types of questions that I would assume the Minister of Health would be interested in. Is that, are those things that he is interested in? Has he asked you those things? Dr. <coughs> Ora. Yeah, I, I speak, uh, we have a, a meeting uh, almost daily and uh, he is aware of the, uh, the backlog of uh, procedures and investigations uh, uh, in Nova Scotia. And uh, I, uh, I obtain information from the health authorities and relay that information to him. So uh, I would say he's very aware. Mr. Houston. Thank you. Yeah, and, and in fairness, I think every Nova Scotian is aware that a backlog exists, um, particularly those that are waiting for a procedure. I guess my, my more direct question to you is um, how aware is the, is the minister? Because I would expect the minister to be more aware than me or a member of the public. So it's a very specific question. Has the minister asked how many Nova Scotians are waiting for which specific procedures and how long until they can get it. Uh, because that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. I want to, I want to be able to assure those people that are reaching out to, to me as an elected official uh, who are waiting for a procedure that, um, that there's a very detailed knowledge of, of what's happening here. So uh, I, I don't want to paraphrase, but I, I heard you in your initial response say that um, you weren't sure when the backlog could be cleared. Uh, because who knows if there's a second wave. Um, I also heard you say that in your specific area of practice, you, you thought it would, might be a year uh, in, in your region and your home region, to be clear. I'm just wondering if you can provide some, some clarity uh, and maybe you can provide it in writing, but, but, uh, but specifically, has, what types of questions is the minister asking? We all know there's a backlog, but I would, I, would, I would hope that the minister is more concerned than just knowing that it exists and be more uh, specifically interested in knowing when Nova Scotians can expect their procedures. Has he asked specific questions? Dr. Oral? He, he has not asked specifically uh, procedure by procedure. Uh, but we have been made aware that from the health authorities that uh, their ability to handle outpatients uh, is taking uh, X amount of time, the ability to handle inpatients, outpatient surgery, hernia repair, I and mean, there's a huge, huge number. Uh, so specifically, I would say that, uh, that no one in, uh, in our department has the exact details, again, because I don't think um, we can obtain those uh, from the health authority at this time. Um, largely because uh, you know their staff that normally would uh, would collect that and 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 uh, uh, evaluate that kind of data 
are very busy with other parts of looking after COVID and, and uh, uh, the manpower necessary to give exact wait times for each procedure would be enormous. So I don't think that information is available even to the health authorities other than to say we have X number of people on the list and at the current rate we're operating, it would take this amount of time. So I can look into that. I can get the details uh, that are available, but I would say that the details from the uh, health authorities, both at the IWK and at NSHA, uh, would not be complete in re with respect to each procedure. Mr. Houston. Thank you. Um, it just in, in your response there, Dr. Roll, you, you, you said that they wouldn't have the information available other than to know that there are this many people waiting for this procedure, so it would take that long. That's actually the, the level of detail that, that, I'm, uh, that I'm interested in. So is that something that the minister has inquired about and asked about and has at his fingertips, this many people waiting for this procedure? Dr. Ora. I think the minister's uh, um, interest has more to do with how are we moving with respect to those procedures in getting them started again and in, uh, in uh, encouraging and supporting the health authority in their ability to do that. Mr. Houston. Thank you. And I think what, I, what I'm trying to get at is, is the um, allocation of resources uh, to make sure that Nova Scotians get the health care they need. That's what I'm trying to get at. And I'm not, honestly, I'm not getting a great deal of comfort that, that, that's, a, that that's an analysis that is happening. For example, um, the Nova Scotia Cancer Care Program um, indicate, according to, the, according to the Nova Scotia Cancer Care Program, between 2009 and 2017, Colon Cancer Prevention Program was able to identify 500 individuals with cancer uh, through, this, through the stool testing. And that same program identified 4,000 individuals who had precancerous pulps detected and removed. That's a pretty powerful program that uh, impact the health outcomes in a very favorable way of a lot of Nova Scotians. So if I look at and I do a quick analysis, to me it would suggest that right now today there could be 30 Nova Scotians walking around with undiagnosed colon cancer. And I guess what I'm trying to understand, and I heard your earlier comment about could be a second wave, we have to save some resources for that to be, respo to be responsive to that, should it come, when it comes, some may say. But I guess between now and then, I'm wondering, um, is, is the minister providing the guidance to direct the resources to where it can be best used? Would the minister know today, is the, is the minister asked you, what's the longest wait list for which procedure and how can we focus on that? Is that a question he's asked? Dr. Oral. <clears throat> I, I've come to the job in April and um, the, uh, you know, I, I came out of a clinical background. Uh, so the administration of a large department of 352 people um, with all of the considerations uh, for the general work of the department as well as the COVID related issues were very new to me. So I have received very significant direction from the minister and part of that direction has to do with the uh, initiation of service so that we can get the backlog of people that have been waiting. Uh, if you take colon cancer as, as your example, uh, there may be 30 people with undiagnosed colon cancer, but colon cancer, uh, many uh, uh, general surgeons will tell you that that disease exists for years and years and years before it's actually um, uh, something that is uh, diagnosed. Uh, some would say it's many years, five, seven, eight years. So in the time frame over which uh, people can, can develop that cancer, um, the, the, the wait of a few months may not be as significant as it sounds. It's a diagnosis that needs to be made, and that diagnosis has to be made in a timely fashion to get on with treatment, but the disease has probably existed a great deal longer than three months. Mr. Houston. Um, I, I, I take your point, but obviously there could be Nova Scotians that have had it for a long time and were waiting until they turn 50 to get their kit in the mail and, and be, be identified. So I think um, I, I wouldn't, um, I'm, I know you're not, but I wouldn't minimize the, the importance to people of getting, of getting the test, but I'm, mo I'm most interested in understanding um, the, the urgency 
that the minister may or may not feel to getting this backlog cleared. Um, and, and to me, the only, the only mechanism that I have to evaluate urgency is to try to understand what questions the minister is asking. And I'm not getting the sense that the minister is asking very specific questions. I'm hearing kind of rough guidelines. Yes, we want to clear the backlog. Um, sometimes it won't matter as much in other illnesses and stuff, but, but that's why I'm so, um, I'm so focused on what is, what, what's the minister asking about the backlog? Because then I, I, was, I would have hoped, and time won't, won't permit because we never really got to the answer of how many people are waiting, but I, I would have hoped that then we could have a discussion about how, do we, how can the resources be allocated to address the backlog. Um, and I do appreciate that you're, you know, so relatively new in the job, and what an what an interesting time to take on that position. So thank you for taking it on in the middle of a, of a pandemic. But, but, but for me, there's a lot of Nova Scotians that are waiting for a procedure, and I'm hearing from them, and I'm sure my colleagues are. And it's as simple as a blood test. Um, and I, I am most interested in the involvement of the minister in, in, in understanding that urgency. But I'm having a hard time getting that. How much time do I have, Madam Chair? A couple of seconds. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Order. Time has lapsed. We'll turn it over to the NDP caucus with Ms. LeBlanc. 20 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for uh, being here today um, and for your opening remarks and for all of the work you've all been doing. Um, I want to uh, thank you for reminding us uh, that a great part of uh, our success in flattening the curve in Nova Scotia uh, has been largely because of the frontline workers, uh, healthcare workers, uh, essential workers who have put themselves uh, and their families at great risk to protect uh, the rest of us. Um, and we're grateful, I'm grateful, uh, to the many Nova Scotians who stayed home as much as they could and kept their kids at home uh, and put their lives on hold for many months and many are still doing it, although it is the first day of school and I've had many conversations with uh, parents in my community about mixed feelings about that. Um, many are relieved that they may actually be able to get a few hours of work done each day. <laughs> um, we. Uh, we also know that we've been protected by our geographic uh, location and our federal border restrictions. But um, we also know that, as you mentioned to Dr. Strang, that there have been lots of communities that have been uh, not spared by the pandemic. Um, and uh, the, the first question I want to ask is in relation to um, racialized communities. So we know from research in other jurisdictions uh, the United States and elsewhere, uh, that COVID-19 is having a disproportionate impact on marginalized and particularly racialized communities. Uh, we, unfortunately, we don't know exactly what's happening in Nova Scotia because of that, um, because we would need to uh, have data publicly available, and we don't have that. So it would be very important to uh, be able to understand the dynamic of, of the impact of COVID-19 on racialized communities in particular. Uh, as we head into a second wave or a potential second wave. I received a letter, I wrote a letter and then received a letter back and I was very pleased to receive the letter back from, uh, from the Minister of African Nova, Sc Nova Scotian Affairs that explained that the province is considering implementing the Canadian Institute for Health Information's proposed standards for race-based and Indigenous identity data collection and health reporting. So I'm wondering if you can tell us what we might already know about the unequal impacts of the virus in our province, first off. Dr. Stray. So we, we do not yet, as you, you're absolutely right to point out, and we're involved in some national conversations with Kai High and with Statistics Canada about uh, providing better uh, race-based information. I know that's a national issue that we're involved in. What we do know that uh, that our experience in the first wave is that we have uh, uh, you know aggregate living populations. Uh, one of the key ones being long-term care facilities are at at, at, at greater risk. Uh, we also know that there are certain populations because of socioeconomic and uh, status 
uh, overcrowding, etc. And we had part of our, our our community, our big community outbreak was in one of those populations. So we're well aware of of, of the implications of the importance of protecting populations that could be at higher risk. We continue to have a strong focus on long-term care. Uh, we uh, continue to have discussions with some of the federal restart money around, for instance, how do we uh, make sure we continue our different model of, 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 uh, uh, of supporting people who are homeless. Uh, and there's a, a still a focus, uh, as I said, during wave one, we had a vulnerable communities popular, uh, committee that was led by Department of Community Services and the Department of uh, Municipal Affairs and Housing with a specific focus on those vulnerable communities. And when we needed to work with, uh, with one of those communities, we were very quickly with the two deputy ministers from those departments leading, we were able to bring a cross-government supports to bear uh, to, to work with local public health. So, for instance, the, when, the, when we were dealing with North Preston, that we had a lot of people who had housing issues, they were concerned about their income, that, you know, that they were concerned if I go, if I test and I test positive, how, who's going to be looking after my family. We were able to very quickly bring housing and financial supports to that specific community on the ground through this vulnerable uh, uh, populations committee uh, that, that, that was able to very quickly engage those government supports. We will continue to work with that model. So we may not have all the specific race base and other data, but we're very, very aware of vulnerable populations and the mechanisms we used in, in wave one will be exactly the mechanisms we'll continue to use to, to support specific vulnerable communities if and when necessary. Ms. LeBlanc. Um, that's great to know. Um, I, I do think that the data, though, has been long called for and long overdue, or the, the collection of the of the disaggregated data for race-based statistics. Um, so, and in the letter from the minister, he did say that the consultation will be um, will be starting. And so, I'm wondering if you can tell us about the consultation plans with the indige indigenous and African Nova Scotian communities. Is there a timeline for implementing the standard? or another strategy for collecting race-based demographic data? Maybe um, Dr. Oral might want to take that one. I'm not sure. Dr. Oral? Yeah, I don't know much about a t the time frame. I do know that it's a significant part of our discussions. And to, um, to um, augment uh, some of what Dr. Strang said, uh, there were some communities, the Indigenous community, for example, we have provided them with uh, PPE and uh, uh, made sure that they have everything they need in terms of managing in, their, uh, in the communities in which they live. Um, when uh, there was an outbreak in uh, North Preston, uh, and um, communities around there, uh, we were very quick to, to go to those communities with the mobile testing and door-to-door -door, uh, to uh, ensure that their uh, communities were as safe as we could possibly uh, uh, make them. Ms. LeBlanc. As Dr. Strang said in his opening remarks, um, unfortunately, we did have 65 deaths uh, in Nova Scotia and uh, 53 of them uh, in long-term care. Um, and uh, I want to um, sort of focus on questions around long-term care now, um, which is a sector, of course, that is under the full regulatory scope of the Liberal government. So I'd like to begin by asking generally, what can you share with Nova Scotians about what is needed in the long-term care sector, both to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in future waves and to strengthen the sector generally? Dr. Strain? Dr. Strain? Or... Well, maybe I'll start, and I'll look to my colleagues to uh, to to uh, to add. So we we're, we're long-term care has well been known for uh, an increased risk for respiratory viruses. So we have, for a long period of time, focused on immunization for against influenza. We have I've been in Nova Scotia for this will be my 21st winter coming up. That every year we work substantively with every long-term care facility to make sure they have a robust. Uh, response plan for a respiratory illness outbreak. We use that plan to then to uh, to adapt that for a very specific COVID-19 uh, virus outbreak. 
um, and then we, and we, we substantially strengthened our measures. Uh, for, and just an example, you know, closing down long-term care facilities to visitors well before we had uh, any cases here in the province. Uh, so we'll continue to use those uh, measures of a strong restrictions, protecting long-term care facilities, having very close surveillance, and then a, then a response. So when we had outbreaks uh, in long-term care during wave one, we had a whole system response that we were very rapidly able to mobilize public health along with the continuing care sector and other parts of the, of the acute care sector if necessary to, to provide the appropriate response for long-term care. Uh, we've been doing a review of, of the, of the long-term care sector with a, with a particular focus on infection control. Uh, I haven't been as involved in that as my other colleagues, so I'm going to turn to them to talk a bit more about that review. Dr. Oral? So long-term care uh, in Canada is the standard of care is, uh, is such that uh, without a pandemic, we probably would have gotten by for, you know, hundreds of years as it was. However, uh, I think the, uh, the opportunity with this pandemic is that we have identified uh, those aspects of long-term care and living in those facilities uh, that make that population of people very vulnerable. They're, they're older people, their immune systems are old, uh, they have other comorbidities, and they cohabit, uh, share bathrooms, uh, they um, uh, are... Uh, in, in situations where the spread of a, an infection, a virus, uh, can occur very easily. So now that we have uh, witnessed how um, drastic this can become, uh, we, we certainly have to do better. We have to do better right across the country, from one coast to the next. And certainly that is true for Nova Scotia, and it's true for every province in the country. So that's what we're going to use the the experience, um, as sad as it is, uh, to uh, to improve our ability to look after this vulnerable group of people. Uh, the reviews that we have uh, initiated at Northwood, where the largest infection took place in a long-term care facility. Um, and for the uh, infection uh, uh, control and prevention uh, um, review that we're doing in every facility across the province, uh, we're going to use the information from that uh, for short, medium, and long-term improvement. The short-term improvement would increase our ability to look after the next wave. What can we do immediately that's going to help us to protect these vulnerable people? What are we going to do in the medium term and what are we going to do over a much longer period of time? And I think every province and every jurisdiction in the country will be looking at the same things. Ms. Lagasse, do you have anything to contribute? No, I don't have anything further on that, Madam Chair. Okay. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. I have to say I'm a little surprised <laughs> by your comments that you, you, in, without a pandemic we could have continued on in long-term care the way we've been going for hundreds of years. I think that that is um, somewhat short-sighted given that we have many, many reports that, that were written long before this COVID-19 pandemic talking about the terrible state of long-term care, at least in Nova Scotia. Uh, we know that Northwood has been asking for years to, uh, to have money from the provincial government to expand their, their um, facilities so that people don't have to be in uh, a double occupancy or triple occupancy rooms anymore. There's many things that have been going on in long-term care. And I think that uh, one could argue that uh, the issues uh, that we've seen at Northwood um, and in other places in Canada and other facilities in Canada um, have something to do with the fact that we haven't been looking after our long-term care facilities for many, many years. Um, I'm, I'm, I know that there's a review going on. I'm sorry it's not a public inquiry, uh, which, is what, um, which is what many people have asked for, the families uh, uh, who had uh, loved ones who, who died at Northview, uh, Northwood, um, and, uh, and us, the, also the NSGEU. I've um, uh, called for a public inquiry. I'm, I wish that was happening. Um, but you say that you have been under you, you've undertaken an inquiry. I'm wondering if you can share with us, given that you have a, a sort of short-term, medium-term, long-term plan, uh, have you, like, what are the learning that you have uh, that, that you can share with us now so far do you do you know of any changes or will you be implementing any changes for a potential second wave dr. oral 
Well, we know of the things that make sense, and uh, the reviews are on schedule. They were uh, slated to be, term uh, to be finished and reported by September the 15th, so that will take place. They're, they're on point uh, to uh, do them in the time frame that they've been given. And, uh, and that's one, ex I guess, advantage of the, of the review is that we will have some uh, uh, oversight and some suggestions that would be uh, available to us as a department earlier uh, than through other uh, uh, review mechanisms. Uh, but uh, basically, we know that um, the, the occupancy uh, itself may not be the issue. It's more to do with the shared bathrooms. And there is some way to manage that, perhaps with people that are uh, mobile who use the bathroom and maybe roommate it with somebody who's not as mobile and would not be occupying the bathroom and things like that. So there's some very practical things that we're able to uh, look at. We uh, look at the staffing, uh, the, um, the staffing models, uh, cleaners are a very important aspect of uh, care in a nursing home. How they, how they do that and if we can isolate them to um, the uh, uh, certain sections so that they're not uh, um, uh, traveling through the whole facility. Uh, so those are some of the things that intrinsically we've, we've recognized and, and we uh, uh, are going to try to improve. Uh, uh, the uh, IPAC, uh, which is the Infection Prevention and Control um, specialty, it really is. I mean, people are trained in IPAC uh, to, to administer it as a clinical specialty. They can identify things that can help to prevent or to control infection when it does break out. We need more people trained and qualified to do that and situated in a, in a nursing home, in a residential care facility, in our hospitals. We need more of those people around to help uh, when uh, a situation like this pandemic exists. Uh, so we know those things, and we're waiting for other recommendations that will come from the review, which, uh, which we will get on the time frame I spoke about by September 15. Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, again, I'm a little surprised at your comments about uh, shared rooms. I, I, I know that there are many experts uh, in this uh, field that do uh, suggest that shared rooms and, and multiple occupancy rooms are, are part of the issue. Um, uh, and of course, you know that we have many, um, many of the sh uh, uh, situations in Nova Scotia and particularly at Northwood where, um, where there are shared rooms. Uh, we filed, uh, speaking of data collection, we filed uh, an FOI uh, to uh, try to understand how many residents in long-term care in Nova Scotia are in multiple uh, occupancy rooms. And according to the response, the government does not either have or keep that information, which I find f frankly shocking. Um, the Nursing Homes of Nova Scotia Association has called on the government to create a multi-year infrastructure plan that eliminates shared rooms in older long-term care homes and creates an environment where residents can live with dignity, pride, and privacy. That's a quote. Uh, is, it, is it a goal of the government to eliminate multiple occupancy rooms? Can you say that right now? And if so, is there a date when they would be eliminated? Dr. Orl? So uh, I, I'm going to address the two areas that I surprised you with with your last two questions uh, uh, about long-term care facilities. Uh, um, the, the shared occupancy is, is very interesting. Um, uh, nur nursing home patients um, quite often feel very isolated. Uh, uh, and it's even, uh, I guess, more uh, pronounced in people that may be on the verge of, of some dementia or some early Alzheimer's. And their association with others is an important part of their socialization in the facility. Uh, so my, I've surprised you twice, and I, perhaps I'm relying on my own personal experience. My mother ended up, for the last year of her life, in a long-term care facility, and uh, she actually enjoyed her roommate. And when we had the opportunity uh, to move her to a more modern facility, which was the original request we made for her placement, and it wasn't available at the time she left hospital, um, she, uh, she did not want to leave. You know, her roommate was her friend by this point, and, uh, and she uh, could have gone to a much newer facility with a single room, 
and uh, asked us not to do that. And uh, we, we didn't. And she certainly finished her days with a friend and socializing and, uh, you know, laughing and talking. They might have talked about the same thing every day, but it was uh, important to them. And uh, the, the, the other issue is that um, we, I, we, the change that's necessary for long-term care is going to be something that takes place over a very long period of time. This is very, very complicated the way continuing care has evolved. And I, per, I don't know about the government's plan, but my personal uh, plan and, and a legacy that I would hope to uh, be able to leave as a deputy minister is that, uh, that we take this um, sector on for change uh, early enough in my um, uh, mandate so that I can, can walk away at the end of my time as Deputy Minister and say that this has been changed because there are many things that can make it better. Uh, regrettably, it's, it's expensive, uh, but I think uh, if it's planned well and initiated over um, uh, many years, I think we can do the right things. Ms. LeBlanc. How much time? Um, About four minutes. Okay. Um, no. We could have a discussion on this. What? for a while. Uh, but I will just say to your point, um, you know, um, that's a good argument for um, increasing budgets at nursing homes and long-term care facilities for more staff and more social coordinators and, and those kinds of excellent programs where people can, um, can, can, can feel like they live in a community. Um, but I want to go, just go uh, on to um, uh, people waiting for long-term care. The number of people occupying a hospital bed because they're waiting for placement in the long-term care facility has increased by 35% since March, while the overall wait list for placement increased by 23%. I understand that part of the dynamic is extra capacity reserved for COVID-19, as you have mentioned, um, uh, for COVID-19 positive patients during the outbreak, and that the province is looking for an organization to add short-term capacity to the long-term care system over the next two years to deal with future outbreaks. So I'm wondering what the uh, timeline for this capacity is, uh, that this capacity would become available, and what will it look like? Um, Dr. Oral, you only have a couple of seconds, sorry. <laughs> so the, I, I think basically, um, we're going to look at uh, other areas uh, and arenas in which these people can be placed before they go to long-term care. So we have to improve Order. and make... Time has lapsed for the NDP caucus. We'll turn it over to the Liberal caucus. Who's going? Um, Mr. Le Levine. Glavine. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and I want to first uh, thank uh, Dr. Strang, Dr. Oral, and uh, Associate uh, Deputy Minister Legassi for being here today as we get our health committee uh, work uh, underway. Uh, I had the good fortune as health minister to uh, work with you, Dr. Strang, just as the H1N1 uh, was uh, nearing, uh, nearing its end, and uh, I, I know how strong you are in terms of both caution and a precautionary approach to uh, keeping Nova Scotians uh, healthy. Uh, as we go into fall and winter and flu season comes along and uh, we do need uh, to have hospital beds available uh, should there be uh, any kind of a second uh, outbreak, out, uh, outbreak. And I know we've always been uh, very significant in the province and our, our leader in the country in terms of uh, taking the, uh, the flu vaccine. What would you say in terms of its uptake this year uh, right across the population and is there any emerging research to tell us that getting the flu shot could be advantageous vis-a-vis -vis, uh, COVID-19? Dr. Strang? So thanks for the, the question, uh, Mr. Mr. Glavine. So, so we know that our last year that our flu uptake in the general population, overall population, was about 39%. We've been hovering anywhere between 38, 39. 
40% if we're lucky uh, for the last number of years. Uh, we have, we have uh, like other provinces and territories, we've taken it, the opportunity of additional flu vaccine become available. So we have enough, we will have enough flu vaccine as our order uh, to for our, just over 50% of the population. So my hope is that we, uh, we max out and use uh, all, um, get 50% of the population immunized this year. There's two things. There's, there's no, these are, these are two different viruses that being immunized against influenza will not protect you against COVID. Uh, and, and but, however, uh, what it does help that is it reduces the likelihood you're going to get influenza, which reduces the impact, the likelihood of you getting sick and having an impact on the health system. But it also makes it what's going to be potentially be com very complicated this winter when you get in flu season is trying to sort out because the symptoms of COVID and the symptoms of flu are very much the same. So we're going to have to get into you know testing people both for influenza, other respiratory viruses, and now COVID. It. And if we, if the more people we have immunized, the less people we're going to have to uh, it, it not it have this, this issue about do they have COVID, do they have flu, uh, which which potentially makes things um, uh, more complicated from a cl very clinical perspective. What we have seen, fortunately, is that, uh, and now I, have, I will say it's very limited experience, but Australia had a very mild flu season uh, because they were in the midst of their flu season while they had a, a, a quite a significant uh, restrictions related to COVID. All the measures that we have, pers you know, maintaining physical distance, masking, etc., those will prevent the spread of influenza and other viruses. So while we need to be prepared and have maximal uptake of flu vaccine, uh, we don't know for sure, we can't rely on it, but we have a hope that uh, if we continue to have all Nova Scotians following the personal preventive measures for COVID, that ha that will have a significant positive benefit and reduce the transmission and the spread of influenza as well. Mr. Clavine. Do uh, Dr. Strang, uh, we're hearing a lot now about uh, uh, the possibility of a, uh, of a, of a second wave. Uh, in fact, I've had uh, people ask me uh, when it's coming, uh, how big do you think it will be? My view has been that uh, in this province, under your leadership, uh, Health Authority and the Department of Health and Government, and the collective effort of Nova Scotians, we, we've done a marvelous job as we look across the globe at uh, containing COVID. So I don't believe there has to be a second wave, but what would you say to Nova Scotians in the, in the weeks ahead as to how we should be working to mitigate and perhaps keep it at the very seldom case that we're currently experiencing? Dr. String. Thanks for the question. So I, I agree with you. We don't that we don't know for sure. When some people talk about a second wave based on experience with previous influenza pandemics, that's more related to an inher something inherent in the nature of the virus. We don't know for sure whether we're going to get a second wave of COVID just because that's the way COVID behaves. There may be some seasonal nature because of it. What's much, what, 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 when I talk about, a, I don't even use the word second wave, I said where the possibility of a resurgence of COVID-19. And that, that frankly, uh, we have a fair degree of control over. We, the, 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 we, have, we really don't have any uh, community spread of COVID-19 and we have not had for the last couple of months. Yeah, so we don't have COVID-19 here in Nova Scotia. Other than sporadic cases that have, that all of them, uh, their original uh, source has been entry into Nova Scotia from somewhere else, other part of the country or somewhere internationally. So that's why we need to continue to focus on having a fairly tight restrictions on our border, who gets in here, and the requirements for ongoing requirements for a quarantine. We continue to look at that. Uh, we have to be cognizant that we are seeing increases in COVID-19 in other parts of the country, or, or sorry, in our larger provinces, BC, Alberta, Ontario, Quebec. The other piece of that, which is, a, is, a, is at our control, is our, is our collective behaviors. What we're seeing, in, to a large extent, driving COVID up in other parts of the country is where there, there's been a relaxation uh, and, and instances where there's been large gatherings, uh, other events which then spark a large community spread. So that's why I keep saying my message to the public is that we have to continue to work together 
all of us to practice the personal protective measures. So we will get some sporadic introduction of COVID-19 into the pro into the province. We have, and that will continue to that will continue to happen. But w if we all work together with the the, the two pronged approach, which is early detection of cases through easy access to testing and then strong public health follow-up to isolate cases, quarantine contacts, as well as everybody practicing those measures. If you're meant to quarantine, quarantine. If you're meant to mask, mask. Everybody social distancing as much as possible. Because that, if we're all doing that well, that means even if there is a case, it's not going to have a chance to have a, uh, expose large numbers of people and have a big, big outbreak. So much of this actually is within uh, our control to manage uh, the uh, and, and, and minimize the chance for a broad spread of COVID-19 in our province. Mr. Glavine. Thank you very much uh, for, for that uh, oversight. Uh, I did sort of want to start here, but I will go back to it. Uh, in the first days when, when COVID came along, as, as we all know, there was, uh, there was no plan book for even you, Dr. Strang, as much as you're familiar with viruses and, uh, and uh, epidemics. W where was your sources of where we needed to go. Uh, was it World Health, was it Dr. Tam, fellow uh, uh, medical officers? Where were you focused to get the best plan for, for Nova Scotians? Dr. Strang, we'll for a while. you were about 30 seconds before. Okay, we very quickly. So we actually did have, we, have, we had a robust pandemic plan which was developed before and then, re, and then revised after H1N1. That was a very good starting point, which led us in a number of key areas that then had to be adapted as we learned more about the specifics of the, the virus. We started having a, a council of chief medical officer calls in January, very in the, within the second, third week of January. Order. Hold that thought. We're going to take a 15-minute recess as we had planned, and we'll start up with you continuing, Dr. Strang. 2.15 sharp. Please leave by the back doors.
order. We'll come to order and we will let Dr. Strain finish his remarks. Dr. Strain. Thank you. So as I was just starting, so we had, uh, we have two regular groups that uh, bring together the chief medical officers and other senior public health folks. We have monthly conference calls and meet twice a year. That's the Council of Chief Medical Officers of Health. And uh, there's the um, uh, uh, Public Health Advisory Committee. Um, uh, so we were meeting, uh, we began talking at Chief Medical Officers of Health middle of June, uh, of, uh, sorry, middle of January, and we do have a mechanism that those two, in the event of an emergency, and we did that at H1N1, we did it for Ebola, and very quickly we brought those two groups together. Uh, and created with a special advisory committee on COVID. And so we ha we began having regular conference calls and uh, for we're now down to twice a week and for a period of time during the peak, we were three times a week. Uh, so those groups of all the chief medical officers of health, that's, that's a key way that we link in uh, to our colleagues across the country. We take advantage of some of the bigger provinces. Ontario has Public Health Ontario. British Columbia has uh, the BC Center for Disease Control. Quebec has uh, INSPQ, their, their public health research agency. Uh, and so they bring information to the table. A key role for the Public Health Agency of Canada and Health Canada, they bring international information to the table. So we're well connected in through that mechanism of a special advisory committee uh, to, to understand what's happening around other parts of the, of the country as evidence evolved and internationally. There's other uh, FPT structures as well. The Council of Chief Dep of Deputy Ministers, Council of Ministers of Health, and there was a number of other structures that were stood up. So we certainly weren't doing this in isolation. Mr. Levine. One of the, uh, one of the, the, the big areas, uh, of course, is uh, the importance of testing. It's been, uh, you know, d d diminished probably in some discussions, but I, I, I know you and the Premier have been big on, on testing. Uh, do, when, we, when we hear of 700 or 800 tests per day, is it, is it also a, a bit of a form of surveillance testing in that we get some sampling from across Nova Scotia, uh, which I think is, uh, is important to uh, the whole evidence-based decision-making? Dr. Strain. Sorry, jumping ahead. Testing always performs two, two functions. It's a clinical function for that individual, but the broad testing, the, the, the aggregate information of the testing is a critical part of our, of our surveillance. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons we've always had a very low, we, we continue to have testing based on symptoms. People need to have some type of symptom, but we've kept a very low threshold. And this is one of the areas where we've actually been work, continue to be informed by our national conversations, what is the group of symptoms that you actually would trigger somebody to actually have a COVID test? And we, we broadened that back in, in May, and we've just now narrowed it back down again. Uh, and the purpose of that was, at the time, to make sure we had a very low threshold of somebody being tested. We wanted to make sure we didn't miss a test. We looked at that for the past three months, and, and we've been able to refine our symptom list again because now we have good evidence on, uh, on uh, in Nova Scotia enough cases of how COVID likely presents. Uh, but you're absolutely right. And we continue to refine our testing approach. We now are testing all university students that are coming in uh, from outside of Atlantic Canada. And we're looking at ways once we uh, have gone through that testing of students while they're quarantined, using that lab capacity, if you will, and the testing capacity for other ways that we may uh, uh, monitor. Uh, for, we're looking at different ways. We may use it at the border, for instance. One example may be uh, are moving into people who don't have symptoms at all, just giving them an opportunity. For instance, long distance truck drivers who are in and out of the United States have maybe have a higher risk. We're looking at how we might test them. We also always have to be, uh, be aware though that we have to maintain our first priority is always people who are symptomatic. And as we get into the winter, uh, we'll see more people just with respiratory symptoms. We also know that we're likely to see more people needing testing when we, as we open up schools, et cetera. So we're very cognizant of making sure that we maintain the capacity for people who might have symptoms and get them tested in a timely manner, even if we might want to do some of these special populations. Mr. Clavine. I, I have one uh, a question that uh, kind of intrigues me a bit in that the cases now that we're experiencing across Canada, we're, we're seeing 
uh, far fewer people going on uh, ventilators. Uh, is that due to the fact that many are in that 20 to 40, that healthier population, or, or are the use of uh, viral medications that are perhaps a help uh, in dealing with COVID uh, if, you, if you have the virus? Dr. Strain. As we shift and we have more people, unfortunately because of some of the uh, uh, behaviors that are not following public health measures, uh, we have a younger cohorts of people who are much less likely to get severe disease. We don't yet have antiviral, any direct treatments for COVID-19, so that's not the reason. It's simply because we have a, a greater proportion of people who, are, uh, who, are, who are, have a lower risk of severe disease. Mr. Glovey. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in terms of, uh, I know what I've been hearing, especially over this past month, uh, uh, my uh, my title of Communities, Culture, and Heritage has been a, a bit of a camouflage, for, and I'm not so much di in the direct line of uh, sport questions, but I'm starting to get them more and more. As children return to school, and we know that uh, sport and athletics uh, is an important part. Uh, for many of our students, and can they hopefully look forward uh, if, th if the landscape stays as it is to having some sport, uh, because school sport does have very special meaning for many of our students. Dr. Stray. Yeah, so this is one of the areas where it's important that we focus on what is the right balance. So right now, we've, we've had since, since in, in, in uh, late June, I believe it was, you can have up to, whether it's a sport or a, uh, a theater event, some kind of a cultural event, you can have up to 10 people that can be together and don't have to keep physically distanced. Your total number can be up to 50, but they have to maintain uh, that physical distance. We've had lots of conversations, and in, in August, we actually had a big conversation with uh, people from your department, Minister, from Sport Nova Scotia, uh, and, and we looked at what it would take to kind of open up sporting activities. Uh, the decision we came to uh, at the time, and the recommendation I then took to the Premier's office, that we needed, to, our priority needed to be to open up educational opportunities first for children and youth and, and even adults for in universities and schools and that we needed to get through the first few weeks of school opening that if we opened up lots of recreational and sport opportunities at the same time for kids we're adding significant risks to them both from school as well as after school and weekend activities so I certainly I saw it just earlier at, at the break I have a meeting coming up with uh, on the sport and the cultural uh, arts activities again uh, third week in September because we've said we've got to get through these first few weeks and then we'll revisit that. Hopefully we can be in a place where we certainly, I certainly recognize the importance of various recreational and sport opportunities, both for children, youth and adults. But how can we do that safely? So we're going to be looking, re-looking at that and can we increase that number beyond 10? Uh, and it's that number 10 which right now restricts things like hockey, basketball, and also puts some limitations if you're going to have a, a, a theater event, whatever. So we have access active plans to look at that, uh, but my focus will always be can we find that right balance and what is, a, what is an acceptable level of risk that we can take on, and always knowing that whatever we do to open up, we can restrict again, uh, it would be one of the first things we would look to restrict if we started to see increased COVID activity again. Mr. Glavine, you have about eight seconds. Oh, well, I'll just say uh, thank you for your leadership and for the teams around you that have uh, supported the province over the last months. Order. Time has lapsed. We'll turn it over to the PC caucus. Mr. Houston, 12 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Oral indicated that COVID was an opportunity for long-term care, the long-term care sector to identify issues. Um, many of those issues had already been identified by the sector. In fact, as my colleague mentioned, for, for three consecutive years, Northwood submitted a request for capital funding to Minister Delory that would have seen the building of new floors to eliminate some of the double and triple bunking of residents. I'd like to ask uh, Dr. Strang, Dr. Strang, knowing what we know now, uh, had Minister DeLore uh, or the government acted on the proposal and implemented it, uh, there would have been 
there would have been fewer uh, multiple occupancy rooms. Knowing what we know now, would that have made a difference in the spread of the virus at Northwood if that proposal had been accepted and acted upon? Dr. Strain. So that's one, one factor. We also have to understand that we had uh, num outbreaks of, uh, of uh, COVID-19 in a number of other long-term care facilities, some of which had the same infrastructure issues that did not spread. So I don't think you can pin it down to any one specific factor. Uh, we certainly know that, uh, that moving forward uh, across the country that uh, we need to look at how we do things uh, differently in long-term care. But these have been long, long-standing problems. We have these same issues uh, every year with influenza. And I, as I said, I've been around here for 20 years. All three parties have been in government. And these are long-standing issues around in long-term care that we need to now pay, uh, as, as, as the deputy said earlier, uh, the COVID has highlighted the need to pay more attention to this sector. There aren't easy solutions, and, and, and uh, but uh, I, I think we have, we have to be careful to, to peel, pick one issue and say that was the cause of, uh, of the outbreak at Northwood. It was a, it was a con I've, been, I've been in depth in looking at that, talking with Northwood, a combination of a large number of factors which led to a, uh, a situation. But again, again we look, look across the country. There's no, there's no doubt that COVID-19 has highlighted long-term care as an issue. It's not unique in any way, shape, or form to Nova Scotia. Dr. Orl, you had something to add? Uh, that's, a, that's a critical question, and uh, we identified early for the review team that we would specifically like them to consider that, that uh, a problem and, uh, and whether or not an expansion would have made a difference. So they will address that in their report. Mr. Houston. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you both, uh, gentlemen, for your response. Um, I, I don't know um, how much there is to address. I mean, it seems pretty obvious that if you have fewer multiple occupancy rooms, that's a good thing for uh, controlling the spread of the virus. Um, this was an issue that Northwood had, had identified and on three consecutive years asked for help. Is this, uh, were you aware of their, uh, Dr. Strang, in your, in your role? Were you aware of the request from Northwood for, for assistance from the government in limiting the number of multiple occupancy rooms? Dr. Strang. My day-to-day -day work, I'm not directly involved in those kind of policy conversations around long-term care and potential investments in long-term care. Mr. Houston. Thank you. And if somebody would have asked you in your official role, uh, would more would more rooms and therefore fewer multiple occupancy rooms be a good thing for infection control? You probably wouldn't have said there's a lot of factors. You probably would have said yes, it would, because it is on its face. Dr. Strang. I would have said it's a one of a number of factors. I'm well aware of lots of other challenges around infection control in the long-term care sector. That's that are we you know we'll hear much more about that in review. And again. I, I always look at things in a comprehensive uh, package and not, and not try to pull out one piece versus another, uh, knowing that all of the things we do, uh, that we're, we're going to be investing in something that therefore there's not resources to invest in something else. So everything has to be looked at in a bigger, a, a big context. Mr. Houston. I, I appreciate that, but uh, the, the room, the room constitution is obviously very significant. But I guess uh, another another significant factor would be PPEs, uh, access to PPEs for infection control. On April eighth, uh, Public Health Canada announced guidelines for long-term care facilities. And one guideline called for all long-term care providers and visitors to wear surgical masks. BC had in fact instructed um, that to happen. A couple weeks prior to that, back as early as March 25th, but it, it took it, it took the province of Nova Scotia four days after uh, that Public Health Can Canada recommendation to actually institute that that guideline. Um, when you were asked about that in a, in a press conference on May 5th, why the four-day delay, you indicated that there's no point in having a directive if you don't have the supply. I interpreted your comments that day to mean that the PPE just didn't exist to do it. Is that the case, that we didn't have adequate PPE as late as April 8th, April 9th, April 10th, April 11th? We just didn't have the PPE to indicate, to fulfill the directive of Public Health Canada? 
Dr. Strain. We're going to answer that in a couple ways. First of all, we have to understand that BC was uh, the, had the first cases of COVID-19 in uh, late January. We didn't get COVID-19 until March the 15th. So they were a number of weeks ahead of us, and therefore they, all their actions were, were, were appropriately ahead of us. Uh, we, we, I was part of conversations looking at the evolving evidence and was well aware that, uh, you know, and part of the discussions that led to the conclusion from the Public Agency of Canada. My answer at the time was not that we didn't have supply, but we needed to make sure that we, because we had been working on a PPE supply for a period of time before that, in anticipation of we might need to have uh, a further uh, distribution of PPE. It was making sure that we had the, the ability, had the right supplies, and we're, or we're going to be able to distribute that in a timely manner. Because what we, what we didn't want to do was come out with a directive that then left long-term care facilities or other health care facilities without the necessary supplies, and then we put them in a really hard position. So that four days was, uh, was uh, really to make sure that the work was done appropriately, and we had supplies and a mechanism to distribute distribute. And I remember that very clearly. We came out on the Monday uh, with, a, with a directive under the public health order, but what people don't know is that the Sunday and the Saturday before that was a, a large amount of work, people working over the weekend, making sure that, we, that the, the PPE that we had was distributed and actually in the hands of long-term care facilities before we brought out the directive. Mr. Houston. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I better understand your answer to be that the province had had adequate supplies, but it hadn't been distributed to the places that would need it to fulfill the directive. Is that a fair summary of? Yes. Dr. Strain. We didn't want to be premature in distributing it to, into sector X when we may need it somewhere else. But when we got the directive, I think the, the, the period of time is a relatively short period of time to get it out and get it in, in the places where clearly the evidence was now telling us it needed to be. Mr. Houston. Uh, th thank you. And, and in terms of, yeah, BC was ahead, and I always thought that was an opportunity to learn, learn some lessons uh, from what was happening there. So on March 25th, they said everyone in long-term care should be wearing a mask. Um, is that something, you know, public health ultimately agreed, um, but it, it, even after BC, and then we, after public health, uh, implemented. But, but there's three timelines there, three, three, three spots in the timeline there. Um, did you ask the, the minister, or did the minister of health inquire of you maybe sometime in late March, hey, should we be having people in long-term care facilities wear, wear masks? Is that something that the minister was asking? Dr. Strain. <laughs> I don't recall him asking the direct question. I was involved in lots of conversations, certainly at the FPT table. BC did that because they were actually having active outbreaks in their long-term care facilities. What drove the, the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, directive, and then our, our director provincially, was more the growing evidence around asymptomatic spread. We were, we were actually having uh, people uh, from, based on our influenza and then our COVID adapted response plans, people were wearing appropriate PPE if they were dealing with somebody who was symptomatic. That was in place for a long period, from the very beginning of our infection control. What shifted was as we got more evidence around people could be asymptomatic, and, and that mean, meaning that you then have to have everybody, uh, whether they're dealing with a resident, whether they're symptomatic or not, have the appropriate PPE. So it was, a, it was not the BC situation. We, ha, we had the same thing in place that if there was a, uh, an outbreak or if, there, if we'd had an outbreak back in February or January, we would have used inf uh, masks like BC did. It was the evolution of, and that occurred over time and it came together very quickly in, 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 in early April that where there's enough evidence now that people could be asymptomatic spreading, which, which then resulted in the federal directive and then the, then the uptake by that in a very timely manner provincially. Dr. Orl, you had something to say? The, the fact is uh, uh, our uh, department recommended and, uh, and supplied masking to Northwood on April the 5th, which was two days before the uh, Public Health Agency of Canada recommended it. So we were 48 hours earlier than their recommendation. And then by April the 13th, that, that date was the mandatory when we, we, everybody had to use it in all, in all long-term care facilities. Mr. Houston. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. So you had the department saying everyone at Northwood should be wearing masks, but the, 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 it didn't happen. And then the feds came after that, and then the province came after that. But the department apparently recognized earlier than anyone else that, that the masking was required, I guess, is what I take from those numbers. But I only have, I, I guess I have uh, one minute. Yes. Um, so um, I, I am I am interested in, in um, um, making sure that we learn these lessons around single rooms. You know, we 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 have put out a, a plan, a long-term plan as to how that can happen in this province. Be happy to share it with the with the department if they're interested. The PPE question about the supply, the access to PPE is is certainly one that is on the minds of a lot of a lot of, a lot of Nova Scotians. We made a lot of offers during the early days to help source uh, help source supply. And now today, of course, we're back to school and, and ventilation, which I guess would be another factor in it all is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a consideration in the schools. I'm wondering, um, the, the Minister of Education suggested that opening a window will provide the same protections and keep COVID out of the classrooms. I'm wondering, is that something, is that advice, Dr. Strang, that your office provided to the Minister, just open windows uh, to improve ventilation in the classrooms? Dr. Strang. You look at any of the public health guidance, in your, even Order. if the, time has lapsed for the PC caucus. We'll move on to the NDP caucus. Ms. Coombs, and welcome to your first health committee meeting. Thank you very much. You and have 12 minutes. Thank you. Um, you'll be aware that staffing shortages are, ne are another critical challenge for the long-term care sector. You may remember that CUPE's submission to the Expert Advisory Panel on Long-Term Care stated that 75% of the LTC workers surv surveyed in 2018 reported working short either daily or weekly. How did the ch this change during COVID-19? Has this ratio gone down or up? Who wants to? Do Dr. Oral? Uh, the... Um, there were problems, again, with uh, the regular staff at uh, Northwood and other long-term care facilities um, becoming ill or becoming afraid and not showing up for work. Um, the minister then initiated the, uh, the act that uh, uh, permitted redeployment, and we were able to get very close to uh, or better than uh, the models, um, the staffing models that were in place. Yeah. So, so it did improve after the redeployment of people to, uh, to the care facilities. Ms. Coombs. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go with uh, another question now, and it's different take. Uh, this question is for Dr. St Dr. Strang. We know that in order to curb the impacts of the second wave, it'll be critical that people who are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 be able to stay home from work take time to get tested self -isol and self-isolate if necessary. It is also part of the back-to-school plan that an entire cohort of students and close contacts might be required to isolate for 14 days. Younger students, of course, would require supervision during this time. These requirements are impossible decisions for people who cannot afford to miss any pay. There are many, many of these in our province. Many of my constituents have been and will continue to be faced with this conundrum. Can you explain the importance of staying home when people are unwell and the role that paid sick days have in this equation? Thank you. Dr. Strang? So thanks for the question. For certainly from a public health perspective for uh, not just COVID-19, it's a long-standing challenge when we've had, whether it's you know, salmonella in a restaurant or you know, influenza every year, uh, there's lots of reasons why people uh, don't stay home or unable to stay home. So we need to recognize that, uh, that we need to work together with government, with, with, with businesses, as well as with, uh, uh, with communities and individuals and families. The policy decisions around that are, 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 are beyond my scope in public health or beyond the scope of the Department of Health and Wellness. But it absolutely is important that we work together to recognize what are the barriers that are there that, that, that are maybe may limit people's ability to stay home and find ways collectively to reduce those barriers. Ms. Coombs. Thank you. I will concede my time um, to my colleague, a member for Dartmouth North. Okay. Ms. LeBlanc. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to go back to long-term care for a moment. Uh, in July of this year, the Nursing Homes of Nova Scotia Association released a paper that described what is needed in the sector. And I'm going to ask you a couple questions about that. So the first one was compensation for frontline staff and management in long-term care can be as much as 30 to 40 percent lower than the same or equivalent roles at the NSHA. The Nursing Homes of Nova Scotia Association has asked the Department of Health and Wellness to conduct a full, uh, full compensation review of long-term care roles. I'm just wondering if this is being considered or if it's underway. Dr. Oral? It isn't immediately underway at this point in time uh, based on you know, our other considerations for, for looking after uh, COVID. But uh, I can assure you that it is a discussion that we've had and that we will be moving on. Uh, over and above the pay differential that we uh, have recognized and uh, would like to, uh, to do something about, I think there has to be um, an elevation, if you will, in the um, status of those people who are employed in the long-term care sector. They should be recognized as specialists, just like a, an ICU nurse or an emergency room nurse. Um, uh, or somebody that works in, in a very specialized area of the hospital. They're geriatric or elder care people um, across all of the, um, the occupations. And uh, I think the way that we can improve uh, their situation and improve the respect um, that we should have for them based on their experience during COVID is to recognize that. Ms. LeBlanc. Well, that's great to hear. I'm, I'm just going to uh, revert back to another question then. The starting wage for a CCA with a diploma is $17.47 an hour. But we've just been updated that the current living wage in Halifax is $21.80 an hour. So do you see any need for changes in the wages of CCAs or personal care workers in long-term care? Dr. Ora. Well, I'm going to rely on my newness to the job and uh, the fact that, you know, I am an orthopedic surgeon uh, taking on a healthcare administration uh, uh, job. So uh, those things are, are all uh, uh, important uh, to consider. And uh, we, you know, obviously have to take advice from people that, that play with numbers and do, uh, do those things. I can assure you they work very hard and uh, it would be my... Uh, um, goal, I guess, to uh, make sure that that hard work is recognized. Ms. LeBlanc. So going back to the, um, the paper from the Nursing Home Association, um, since 2016, we have heard that a blueprint for continuing care is underway, but a vision has yet to emerge. The Nursing Homes of Nova Scotia Association is calling on the department to lead a sector-wide engagement process to build a vision and a framework for long-term care. So is this being considered? Dr. Oral. Absolutely. Ms. LeBlanc. And any timelines on that? Dr. Oral. Well, again, uh, you know, we are, there, there's a great deal of effort and a great deal of manpower that's engaged in, in, in managing what we've done. Um, I mean, it's, it's been across every branch of our department. It's been across every department in government. So we haven't, you know, the, 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 the facility of time to sort of engage in one or another project at this point has not been real because of our concentration on looking after Nova Scotians. And uh, once we get through the resurgence and create what has come to be commonly known as the new normal, I think then we get back to looking at some of these, uh, um, these uh, 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 points that have been identified and that we would like to, uh, to further investigate and work on. Ms. LeBlanc. Operational funding for long-term care homes has been significantly reduced in the last several years. The needs of long-term care homes have grown, particularly since the COVID-19 pand pandemic, but the resources have not, nor has their distribution been revised to, uh, to create equity across the system. The association has called on the department to revise funding models and ensure equitable access across the system. Is this being considered? <laughs> Dr. Oral. Yes, and again, do I have a time frame? I do not. Uh, we are going, we're going to uh, get through, we're going to look after these facilities. I can assure you that anything we needed to do in terms of staffing, procurement of PPE, uh, extra um, um, administrators, uh, IPAC personnel, et cetera, has all been done without consideration of budget or uh, deficit. 
So we've moved on those things uh, without uh, any reference to uh, uh, the deficit. We are $368 million deficit at the Department of Health and Wellness and we still will do what we have to do for the people in Nova Scotia and for the vulnerable people in these nursing homes. Ms. LeBlanc. Uh, so in 2016, the government cut funding transfers to long-term care by 1%, which had the effect of worsening shortages in the sector. During the pandemic, your department spent an additional 45 million, as you're talking about, on COVID-related costs in term of in long-term care, and I absolutely am confident that that those costs have been, I mean, those expenses have been warranted. That spending has been warranted. Can you provide us with a breakdown of how and where the money was spent, and can you tell us what permanent investments will be made in long-term care as a result of learnings from COVID-19? Dr. Oral. We, we can provide that. I would uh, defer to submitting that to the uh, committee uh, afterwards. But we do have a breakdown of where our uh, funds were, were spent and, and what COVID expenses we entailed. Yes. Ms. LeBlanc. Which time? Oh. You have um, under three minutes. Okay. I'll try to keep this short. Um, so we know that many, many families uh, who have uh, loved ones in long-term care facilities have been heartbroken about not being able to visit for long periods of time. Uh, we know that um, many of the residents in long-term care have suffered in, 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 um, in a social way uh, because of that. And many families have been talking about the decline that they've witnessed in their loved ones because of not having lots of visits and um, et cetera. Um, the, we know now that this morning um, there was a, it was announced that up to two designated caregivers per resident can be trained to provide support, which is a great announcement. So caregivers will be need to train be uh, will be will need to be trained in infection control measures. But staffing shortages are already acute at many facilities. So can you explain what resources will be provided to long-term care homes to be able to train and facilitate the de de designated caregivers? Dr. Stray. Yeah, so um, recognizing some of the staffing issues, I mean, we've got to understand that these individuals, these these personal care, you know, family personal caregivers, are are not going to require intensive training in in. Uh, I guess I'll call it complicated or complex infection control. Uh, it's very much basics around uh, around hand washing, uh, wearing a mask, those kind of pieces. More, more intensive, they're not going to be doing the kind of care that would require more intensive infection control. So uh, I, I think uh, th without being on the front lines, I don't see this as being a huge issue for uh, f for long-term care facilities uh, to, to take on, uh, they'll have to. Do, part of the, the part of what they'll be working with is what capacity do they have with each facility to over time to do the appropriate, the necessary training for family caregivers. At the same time, taking on the family caregivers will help with some of the other staffing pressures that they have. But this is the, the, we've got to remember that family caregivers are are, are doing basic care. Uh, they're not doing much more of the complex care that would requ require higher levels of infection control and personal protective equipment. Ms. LeBlanc, you have a few seconds. So outside of those designated caregivers, I'm wondering if you can describe what more, uh, more resource, resourcing for facilities to, um, to be able to support more uh, visits and longer visits with loved ones. Order time has lapsed for the NDP. We'll turn to the Liberal Caucus, Ms. Di Costanzo, 12 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I just want to start um, to by thanking Dr. Strang, and I want to tell you, you have a, an admirer in Ontario, my sister, who is envious of our situation here and would like to have uh, the same numbers in Ontario and to feel. So she's always watching you and, and wanted to send her regards to you and, your, and the work that we've done here in Nova Scotia. My question is about testing. In your remarks, you said we started with, with under 200 and we went to 1,500. Can you explain to us what did that mean in staffing? Uh, is it the, the, the quality of the testing that improved? Or how did you move staffing in order to do seven times the volume? Dr. String. 
So I'll tell you, I mean, I'm not the lab person. And I, don't, I, can't, I don't know all the, the details, but there's been efforts in the several areas. We've, uh, they, they, re, they purchased another piece of uh, the appropriate testing equipment. They uh, redeployed another piece of equipment, was one piece, so more testing capacity. Uh, certainly Dr. Hatchett and his team have been very proactive, uh, and they, were, they have, he's thought well ahead and, and was purchasing, and we've stockpiled uh, uh, you know the reagents and necessary lab supplies uh, to give that in, in, in the enhanced capacity. They have certainly redeployed staff from other other parts of the laboratory, uh, which uh, which is added to that. And then I think one of the key things they in my discussions with them, they went to a 24/7 staffing model. Uh, so and they, that maintains today, and, and, and in my conversations with Dr. Hatchett, they may stay with that. There's the efficiencies within that, but it's you know people have to now go to shift work, etc. So uh, all those pieces together, that's the kind of level of detail I can speak to. But very you know, uh, I think they deserve a lot of credit for the work that we're doing to go from that 200 a day to. And we can go beyond, if we had a real surge, we could go beyond 1,500. And we're pushing that in, a, you know, that 1,500 in the last week with all the university capacity. But that, to me, has been one of the hallmarks of our success, is the ability to rapidly ramp up our, our, our lab throughput. Ms. D. Costanzo. As a follow, is that probably uh, a lot of the staff that were doing other tests were moved and deployed to use COVID testing, and that's why maybe we stopped some of the uh, unurgent or not urgent uh, uh, procedures that my colleague was asking about. Could that have been some of the staff that were moved from one section to help with the other section? Dr. Strain. That's certainly my understanding. One of those components is redeploying, like we've done in other parts of the health system, to meet the demands for COVID. We've redeployed within the health authority, and the lab is no different. Ms. DiCostanzo. Well, my other question was about 811. Uh, can you explain to us uh, how they managed the number of calls and what did they put in as a process, and would that stay uh, in, in for the next? Does anybody have the 811? <laughs> um, Ms. Leglat, yeah, So very early on when the decision was made to have 811 field the calls for screening and testing, uh, we worked closely with them as a partner to increase their capacity. And very early on, they made the decision to um, put a call out for additional workers, retired nurses in particular, who do the screening calls, and then other staff who do the initial triage. So our initial uh, work with them was to ramp up on staff, and then subsequent to that, we did location, leased some additional space, bought additional technology, invested in all those things to allow them to ramp up their staffing so that they could increase their call period over a longer period of time than they, norm than they would in normal times during the day, that we extend ended the call period as well. Ms. DiCostanzo. So then has it really slowed down right now? And, and how do you plan for, uh, do you plan it monthly as, you know, November, you, you, you're planning your staffing or are you deploying people from, is it just the staffing that may require that I'm concerned about or would like to know about? Ms. Lagasse. They continue to have the staff to be able to increase as required. They have the location and everything that we've maintained, knowing that there may be a resurgence, that they are able to staff up, staff down as required. Ms. D. Costanzo. Thank you again, and I'll pass it on to my colleague, Ms. Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller. Thank you, and uh, I welcome this opportunity to actually say thank you for all the work you've done. I think I passed this on a, a little while ago, too. Uh, just the sense of confidence you gave to Nova Scotians, you know, every day with the press conferences, with the Premier. I think it was a, a great opportunity to be able to share, you know, what was going on. There's nothing worse for Nova Scotians than to fear something that they don't know. And uh, the department always keeping them on track, knowing what was going on, what was expected. And I think that that helped towards the calm in the province and where it was going. I did want to mention a little uh, personal experience we've had during this COVID time. My husband was diagnosed with colorectal cancer in February. Uh, because of his comorbid 
comorbidities, he uh, was able to uh, have his surgery in a uh, very successful surgery in April. And my daughter, of course, as a result of the, the family history, was able to have a colonoscopy just two weeks ago. So certainly there were no delays at all involved. And I just want to say, you know, I was, I was quite surprised by both, you know, that the surgery would be as quick, you know, handled as quickly as it was, you know, how it was handled. And again, with my daughter's testing as well, how quickly that was done. There didn't seem to be too much of a wait there at all. And certainly we're dealing with the northern areas for, for the testing. But uh, so it was a very positive experience for my family. So I want to pass that congratulations on to the department for uh, continuing to do the work that you're, you're doing. Now we've seen a lot of uh, negative things that have happened with, uh, with it during the last six months with COVID, but some of the good things that, that have come in have been doctor's practices, and that has been uh, the, uh, the virtual care. Do you expect that to continue in the future? Dr. Oral? So um, virtual care has always been here. Uh, what we did during COVID was uh, we facilitated uh, virtual care. Uh, we made it easier to use. Uh, we reimbursed for the same fee that uh, would have uh, been given for uh, an in-person visit and encouraged people uh, who were afraid to go to the doctor's office, who were afraid to go to a hospital or a clinic uh, to uh, you know, participate with their health care provider in that way. Uh, we have discovered a great many things that are useful and valuable about it. I would s say that it's here to stay, and I think we will be using it increasingly more common uh, than, than we did prior to COVID. Uh, the, uh, the issue, of course, will be quality, safety, and control, and we'll have to make sure that um, it is uh, uh, um, improved and uh, made more popular uh, with the uh, restrictions uh, for you know safety and control there's been a great deal of satisfaction with it uh, from uh, the people that used it during the uh, pandemic uh, I think that was uh, largely because uh, they were fearful they'd lose complete contact with their doctor or their nurse practitioner. Uh, now, uh, when they have the ability uh, to, uh, to uh, engage uh, personally, they may not have the same level of satisfaction. So we have to make sure we do that um, carefully and, uh, and people still have options. Uh, the mental health and addiction sector and uh, the pediatric sector have used it extensively in the past and uh, we're looking to some of their experience uh, to see how we uh, uh, proceed with it carefully. Ms. Miller. And I just want to again thank you for taking your uh, your time. I know you're all very very busy. It takes a little while to get ready for these uh, for these uh, committees. And uh, thank you for being there. I'll pass it on to my colleague, Mr. Jessam. Four minutes. Four minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to be concise here. Uh, I'm 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 mindful that uh, over the past several months, people who are not trained medical professionals have had have had to. Uh, um, have had the burden of, uh, of triaging people in their workplace, um, visitors to their restaurant, uh, employees. Um, the one that comes predominantly to mind today are, are, are teachers who are going to have to triage their students um, and, you know, create some disruption in families. And, and I'm just... I'm just trying to ask uh, perhaps a question for Dr. Strang. Um, what message would you send to, to teachers in, in triaging their students uh, around uh, students that ex express symptoms? And beyond that, what message would you send to families um, in support of teachers who have to make these decisions? Dr. Strang. So thanks for the question, and I think um, Maybe it's the word triage. And we're not expecting people without a healthcare background to, to be doing any clinical assessment. Our overall message, and we, we have produced uh, some fact sheets late last week for principals and teachers on this, but the overall message, whether it's for teachers or whether it's for families, is quite, quite in, in my, my mind, quite simple and succinct. If you're not feeling well, 
stay home or go home. So what we're asking teachers to do if a child pre presents to them and says, I'm not feeling well, or making some judgment that, that, that especially younger children just don't look well, we said, you don't have to do a clinical assessment. Isolate them within the school uh, as quickly as you can. Call the parents or the caregiver and get them home. And then it's the responsibility of the parents or caregiver to take the next step, which we say, if somebody is unwell, they should do, if possible, do the online 811 assessment. If they don't have internet, then, then call 811 and then get further direction from 811. So the basic message is you don't need to assess symptoms in a great deal if somebody is unwell. And that's all we're asking uh, of, of teachers in the school system is to recognize or if somebody, a younger child especially, is unwell or if a child comes to them and says, I'm not feeling well. Uh, and we, we said, always err on the side of caution. Uh, and we'll get some experience with this as time goes on. Mr. Jessam. I, I guess in the 30 seconds I have left, I would just say that, you know, the consequence of, uh, you know, having to... I guess, trigger this sequence of events. Uh, as a society, perhaps we need to be more mindful than ever that our schedules may become disrupted and um, our day-to-day -day is, is going to be challenged in terms of, uh, you know, relying on a particular schedule um, because of instances such as this where... Order. Time has lapsed. And we will ask for a closing brief closing remarks by Dr. Um, Oral, and do you have any, Dr. Um, Strang? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Dr. Oral. So as Dr. Strang identified in his opening remarks, this COVID-19 virus uh, was an unprecedented global event. Uh, it's a dangerous, sometimes fatal infection, and particularly devastating for the most vulnerable. There's no playbook and without a drug protocol for cure or in the absence of a vaccine, we were required to manage the disease based on scientific and public health principles. What was done early in the pandemic was based on information and experience at that time. We have learned much in the interim and we will rely on that knowledge as we move forward. As I told you, I came to the department as Deputy Minister on April the 1st perhaps the worst <laughs> April Fool's joke of my life. <laughs> this uh, was after 31 years as an orthopedic surgeon and uh, based on my clinical experience on the operational side of the system, I was impressed with the measures that had already been initiated. I felt that the communication with healthcare providers and the general population was impressive. And had I continued to practice surgery instead of taking this job, I would have been very confident in the actions that was taken to protect Nova Scotians. The travel restrictions, PPE procurement, stabilization of the workforce for physicians, redeployment of essential workers, and the guidelines from public health uh, were critical in the management of this uh, first wave. As the curve flattened and our epidemiology improved, appropriate steps were put in place to reopen the healthcare system and to address issues such as wait time and the issues we have discussed about long-term care facilities and as well to open the economy. The department has worked broadly across government to do this, uh, to create a new normal so that we can, main, w while at the time maintaining the capacity to handle the resurgence that we anticipate. There is and should be a great deal of focus on the long-term care sector and its facilities. To that end, we have two reviews. As I stated, they'll be uh, on time uh, for a report on September the 15th. Uh, Northwood was a tragedy that we um, have identified and would like to do much better. And the IPAC review across the province will help us as well. These were undertaken with the lens of how we can move forward on a short, medium, and long-term basis to improve the entire sector. The national standards of care in Canada are all subject in every jurisdiction to improvement and we will do what we can in Nova Scotia. We continue to improve our ability to uh, look after this population with role clarity, uh, pr uh, PPE uh, procurement, improvement in IPAC principles and practice and increased human health resources. So we're prepared as we move forward based again on scientific and public health principles as we manage a disease that continues to put the world at risk. 
Thank you. And thank you, our three witnesses, for keeping us safe. Um, we're doing the business meeting later. Um, I thank you for your uh, attendance here and for all the answering of questions. And go back and take care of Nova Scotians again. Thank you very much. <clears throat>
this important committee uh, was created or began meeting back in January 2019 and, and discusses important matters to Nova Scotians, uh, matters regarding access to and the delivery of health care. Uh, both opposition parties have made a number of requests uh, since our standstill uh, back in February 2020 to meet uh, either in person or through virtual means and those such that those requests were were uh, I guess ceased or not accepted by the government um, therefore I'd like to um, make a motion that the Standing Committee on Health um, be required to meet monthly either in person or via virtual means to ensure that in the event of a second wave or resurgence resurgence in cases, we do not have to wait another seven months for a meeting of this important committee. There is a motion on the floor. Ms. De Costanzo. Could I call for a five minute recess just to discuss it? And could we have it in writing as well? Or is that not possible? Not possible? I, I don't know if there's time um, to have it in writing. All right, Mr. LeBlanc. I guess we'd have to make a motion to extend the meeting since we have less than six minutes left to conduct this okay, business. Okay, we've already extended. I know I'm supposed to be somewhere at already. So um, any, there, Ms. De Costanza. Maybe a three minutes. Three minutes? Just. Okay. Thank you. Three minute recess. Oh, do we have to do the motion? We didn't vote on the motion. Okay. Order, Mr. Jessam. Madam Chair, I, I'm 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 not sure exactly what the distinction between this motion is and what I guess the status quo is. I mean, this committee is is um, in most cases mandated to meet on a monthly basis. Um, given the given the current emergency circumstances that have prevailed, um, I guess. Outside of my purview, decisions have been made to focus the attention of health professionals on providing health care to Nova Scotians. So I'm, 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 I'm not sure. Uh, I guess the perhaps the the decision to um, focus the attention of health care providers across the province on providing health care. That decision could come come forward again in, in in the future but again I don't I don't know what the distinction is between what our committee uh, shoots to achieve on a given day and and what the the honorable members motion is uh, um, that's on the floor today mr. LeBlanc so if memory serves me correctly this committee is not mandated within its rules to meet monthly unlike other committees our roles as MLAs and especially uh, opposition MLAs is to bring a level of accountability and transparency to government. 
Um, so that's why we're bringing forward this with this motion. Uh, we hear our, on a daily basis through our constituency offices, uh, you know, questions regarding barriers to access to care. We discussed it this afternoon regarding preventative measures. Uh, you hear from uh, females that are, that are struggling to get in for a mammogram, for example, and I th I'd be appalled if we haven't all heard about the challenges to, to get uh, a blood test done. So. It's our responsibility here to ensure that, you know, despite what may come uh, hypothetically, that we take the appropriate measures at this time to uh, lay the stonework that we can continue to work uh, through this committee. So whether it be virtually or in person, uh, it's incumbent that this committee make this decision today. But just be clear, we do not make policy at this committee, right? So we, we can't change things that are in the department. Um, Ms. LeBlanc, quickly. Well, I, I'm going to ask, thank you, Madam Chair, to extend the meeting by three minutes so that we can finish this important discussion, or four minutes even, um, till, say, 3.20. That's six minutes. Are we in agreement? So what if Ms. LeBlanc. Thank you. I, I would like to, I think that everyone understands the spirit of this motion. I think generally we all get what, what the uh, member is trying to do here. But what I would like to propose is an amendment uh, that would say that the health committee, which meets 12 times a year, would need unanimous consent to not meet at a given time. So that would mean that everyone would have to agree that the meeting is cancelled. And if, no one, if we don't get unanimous consent, then the meeting would have to go forward either in a virtual way or an in-person way, which is the same way that the, I believe the Human Resources Committee uh, is, functions, or one of the other committee functions. So that is my amendment, that the Health Committee would need unanimous consent to not meet one of the 12 uh, uh, at a, a regularly scheduled monthly meeting, which are scheduled 12 times a year. I'd like to weigh in with the, um, Mr. Hebb on this one. Well, I'm, I'm not sure that the, um, the amendment is necessary. The, the Human Resources Committee is mandated by the rules to meet monthly, and I've given the opinion that in order them not to meet requires unanimous consent. So if this committee were to provide uh, by the original motion that the, the committee must meet monthly, uh, then that would follow that uh, they would not have to meet if there was un unanimous consent, which is, I believe, the nature of, of the amendment. Ms. LeBlanc. If, if then, thank you, if that's the case then, if we are, in, our, our uh, colleagues from the Liberal Caucus have said we are mandated to meet monthly, so we, then the question is, well then why haven't we met monthly for the last seven months? Um, so it would be great to know for sure if we are mandated, in which case Mr. Hebb's uh, uh, advisement would, would make sense. Ms. Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my concern here is that we don't know what's going to happen in the next while. We don't know if there's going to be a second wave or if there's going to be a third wave or if the economy is going to be shut down again or what. So I think there's too many variables in play here, you know, to be able to say that we have to or we have to have unanimous consent. I, I think we should continue the way we are and barring any unforeseen circumstances like uh, uh, another uh, outbreak of, of COVID or a serious outbreak that doesn't, that actually shuts down things in the house again, that uh, we would normally normally meet, and uh, I don't think there's any need for any of these motions, and I call for a vote. Mr. Houston was head at... Uh, thank, you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the, the member is actually citing the reasons why this committee should meet monthly. It's because we don't know what's happening. Healthcare is a big issue in the, in the minds of Nova Scotians. It's half of the budget. Uh, this committee should be meeting, and I, and I, will, and I, will, just, I will just offer that during this pandemic, families found a way to communicate through Zoom and, and Teams, and companies found a way to communicate. The, the National Parliament found a way to communicate. This health committee can find a way to communicate, and it should meet monthly. OK. Um, there's been an amendment by Ms. Uh, LeBlanc. Um, we need to vote on that first, if there's not unanimous agreement with that. No, there is not. So we will have a vote for on the amendment. In a recorded vote. Recorded vote. Yeah. 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 On the amendment. Which 
Yes, Ms. Yes, Ms. Kavanaugh. All right, um, Ms. Coombs. Aye. Ms. LeBlanc. Yes. Mr. LeBlanc. Oui. Uh, Mr. Houston. Yes. Ms. Di Costanzo. No. Mr. Jessam. No. Ms. Miller. No. Uh, Mr. Glavine. No. Ms. Lonas Croft. No. So we'll vote on Mr. LeBlanc's motion. Recorded vote. Ms. Coombs? Aye. Ms. LeBlanc? Yes. Mr. LeBlanc? Oui. Uh, Mr. Houston? Yes. Ms. Di Costanzo? No. Mr. Jessam? No. Ms. Miller? No. Uh, Mr. Glavine? Uh, no. Ms. Lonas Croft? No. Five no's, four yeses. Uh, time has lapsed for our meeting. We will now adjourn the meeting with our next meeting Tuesday, October 13th, and hopefully Doctors Nova Scotia will be here. Thank you all. Thank you, Please leave by the rear exit.